you all for that. Uh, had really good time. And now for our last speaker for the day, we're getting closer to the end. Tim was also sitting here throughout the day. Uh, he also should get a, a certification for uh, being the great listener. And now it's time to talk. We heard Amazon throughout the day, right? We heard the name and the term uh, all the time. Now, our Tim is going to talk to us about some of the misconceptions in cloud, break some myth. Good luck, Tim. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for hanging out, guys uh, and gals. Uh, I usually get the after lunch spot, and so people are falling asleep, you know, sort of sleeping off their lunch. But this is a whole new thing. Uh, but thanks for, thanks for making it to the very end of today. Uh, thanks for the CSA inviting AWS to participate in this event. Um, when Jim Rivas, the CEO of, of the CSA, reached out to me uh, a while back and asked, invited me to this event, he said he wanted to provide people with an update on sort of a European view of, um, of cloud and, and cloud security. Um, and so I've worked at AWS uh, based in London for the last 18 months or so. Uh, prior to that, I worked at Microsoft uh, for 18 years. And so I've done this security thing for quite a while, different roles. Uh, I managed Microsoft's incident response team. Uh, I was their director of trustworthy computing, director of identity, um, a bunch of stuff. Um, so we're here to talk about sort of AWS and sort of our, our view of the world with the kind of a European view, I think. And so, you know, this is pretty informal. If you have any questions along the way, just let me know. Um, and so the view is if you're a European customer or a European organization and you're trying to figure out what your IT strategy is moving forward, um, I just wanted to share some data with you that is very definitely top of minds of the CISOs that I talk to as I travel around uh, all of EMEA as AWS's regional leader. Um, first and foremost, their frontline vulnerability management teams are getting absolutely slammed. And you can see from this graph, this is all of the publicly disclosed vulnerabilities that are assigned a CVE number in the NIST uh, database, the National Vulnerability Database. You can see from 2016, or sorry, that's on the next slide, you can see the number of breaches that um, have been occurring. This is just the top 25 list, really. And if you take the top 10 of these, okay, uh, people, often will think, hey, this is like a distant past problem. Like these, these big breaches don't happen anymore. Maybe four or five, 10 years ago they would happen. But if you take a look at the data, the top 25 breaches of all time that you can see here in terms of the number of records that were actually uh, potentially disclosed, and you can see that it's huge, right? The average one of these breaches is a number of records that's greater than the population of every, of every country in the world except for you know the biggest three right India China United States, um, and indeed the top ten if you take a look at them happened in the last two years, so this isn't a distant problem this isn't a problem that's going away it's actually speeding up everything about cybersecurity is accelerating now, um, the other thing that's on the top of mind as I as I started to say with vulnerabilities is vulnerabilities are at historic highs ever since the NVD database was brought online in 1999. There's never been a time when there's been more publicly disclosed vulnerabilities across the entire industry, ever. So between 2016 and 2017, you know, it's a 120% increase between 2016 and 2018, that's 157% increase in vulnerability disclosures. Okay, back here, when I saw this number uh, back when I lived through the 2014 timeframe, um, helping my, you know, Microsoft with vulnerabilities, we thought, wow, this is a lot of vulnerabilities. Okay? Little did we know that all these years later, we would be looking at more than double that number. Okay, so these vulnerability management teams are getting absolutely slammed right now. This is not news to them. They've had to be dealing with this now for a couple of years. Um, in addition to all the all of the breaches that we talked about, okay. Now, on top of that, you layer on GDPR. Everyone has been worried about GDPR for the last two and a half years. There's not a single organization I talk to uh, in EMEA or in the United States, Canada, anywhere in the world that's not talking about GDPR and how to comply with GDPR, which is really hard. In fact, many of the big organizations I talked to stopped using the words comply to GDPR because they simply don't know how. 
right? It's a very hard thing for them to get their heads around. Now, just a few weeks ago, you can see that they published a document here uh, to talk about the first nine months of GDPR enforcement and what that actually looks like. And so in the first nine months of GDPR enforcement, you can see that there were 206,326 cases opened in the 31 countries in the EEA. Okay? And so there's a lot of activity that's still ongoing. Total fines, you know, 55, 56 million euro. And the thing that's most telling, though, is this number right here. Of the 206,000 uh, um, complaints, cases that were opened, 31% or 65,000 of those are from breach notifications. So that's 65,000 breach notifications in the first nine months of GDPR. Okay, so this is super hard for customers. This is super hard for organizations that in the face of historic highs in vulnerabilities, in the face of ongoing breaches, okay, and GDPR enforcement now is a big deal and it's getting harder and harder. Okay, so these are headwinds that our customers are running into that keep the CISO and the risk managers and, and all the rest of the folks that work on this stuff super worried and super busy. They know what they've been doing for the last 20 years isn't working anymore. It really isn't. And they want to go to the cloud. So I work with public sector customers. They want to go to the cloud. But their, the things at the top of their mind are, are absolutely everything that we heard from all the presenters today at the conference. They're worried about all of the stuff that you guys are talking about. Okay, and, and, and it's a rational fear. You're, you're talking about a big change here potentially for organizations. So when I come into the room to talk to them, this is what I call the usual suspects. Okay, this is what they want to talk about in the order they want to talk about it. So before we'll ever even talk about cybersecurity, I have to talk to them about the Cloud Act. I have to talk to them about US government access to data specifically. Okay? And if, you know, their biggest worry is that the US government is trying to get access to their data. And so we'll spend time talking to them about this and show them, you know, all the tools they have, both legal tools and technology tools that will help them mitigate that threat. Okay? And so um, we're, we've been able to onboard lots and lots of public sector customers because once we walk them through those mitigations, they're no longer worried about it. They know they have bigger fish to fry, like all those vulnerabilities we talked about, all those breaches we talked about, GDPR compliance, right? So this stuff begins to fade away once they actually see how they can manage it, okay? The other things you can see here, data residency, data sovereignty, you've heard a couple of the presenters today mention these topics. Um, Olaf mentioned it in his great presentation uh, just prior to this one. Um, and customers wanna know, like when I put my data in this cloud, does the data move? Where does it move? Who decides when it moves? Okay, the reality in an AWS is when you pick a region and you put your data in that region, your content never moves unless you decide to move it. Okay, so this isn't a case where content moves because we're trying to help out. This is a serious uh, requirement from companies like Olaf's and all of yours. Okay, super important we will not move that data because that's how important it is. You guys have regulation you've got to comply with. We have regulation we have to comply with. But getting clear on that, getting clear on the details, what doesn't move. If, you're, if your AWS account details, remember you can log into your account from anywhere in the world. Okay, well those details, your login information, you need to be able to log in from other parts of the world, right? Now you have total control over that. If you want to keep all of your identities on premise and never federate that with the cloud, you can do stuff like that. So there's a thousand, thousand ways to do anything in AWS, but it starts with your requirements and getting really, really clear on what those requirements are and then how to architect a system that meets those requirements. Because there's no one way to do things in cloud. There's no two ways to do things in cloud. There's a thousand, thousand ways to do things in AWS. Okay. All right, um, encryption and key management. Encryption has, uh, this is the renaissance of encryption, right? If you're gonna put data in a public cloud and it's sensitive in nature, or even if it's not, some organizations want ubiquitous encryption. You wanna have the ability to encrypt the data. You want options whether you encrypt it on premise before you put it in the cloud, encrypt it in the cloud because the cloud 
our key management services integrated in all the services. So that really minimizes the the, the uh, light where you know that that day of light where your keys or your data actually are in clear text, right? That minimizes it by having it integrated with the services. But if you don't want to use that, you don't have to. You have a whole bunch of options when it comes to encryption and key management. You can keep the keys on premise. You can use a hardware security module and keep the keys in there. Okay, there's all sorts of options, a thousand, thousand ways to meet your specific requirements. Okay, and then we heard this one several times today, right to audit, right? Lots of customers want the right to audit. And you can't blame them because for 30 years, they've been in a managed service provider world and the managed service providers haven't done a particularly good job of giving them access to information in near real time or even periodically. So they demand the right to audit as a procurement artifact and in all the contracts. And so here comes AWS and we offer customers the ability to audit their stuff, their account and all of the infrastructure they use, all of that stuff in near real time, continuously. Okay, never been available before. Okay, and then you can audit that against whatever standard you care about. And if it ever starts to skew out of that standard, you have all sorts of options because it's code. You can bring it back into the standard. You can send mail to the IR team, to the audit team, to the lawyers, like whoever you want to send it to, right? It's code. So there's a thousand, thousand ways to do this, right? But now that you have the ability to audit your stuff in near real time, continuously, in addition to the 60 plus different certifications and attestations that some of the other presenters talked about today, okay, why would more auditors in the data center, how would that add assurance? How would that be more security to, the, to already the, all the audits we do across 165 services in 21 regions and 66 availability zones? It's not additive. More audit is not the answer. Okay, no more, just more point in time audit is not the answer, right? You have the ability to do continuous audit, okay? And then you can do really interesting things based on what you're seeing happening. Never had the ability to do that before. So this is why the right to audit isn't as important today as it once was, because even if you do have the right, have the right to audit and your auditor came in, what would they add on top of all of the 60 plus different certifications and attestations that we've got from world-class auditors in addition to you know, your ability to audit in real time. Okay? All right, so these are the issues. These are the underlying assumptions that lead to those issues, lead to those things being top of mind. Okay, the number one issue that organizations that first contemplate moving into the cloud have, the number one thing that takes them down the wrong road is the assumption that the public cloud is the same as a managed service provider environment. It's the same type of thing that they've been using for managed service providers for 25 years. This one just happens to be owned by Amazon and, and they're based in Seattle, Washington. Okay. Nothing could be farther from the truth. This is a self-service cloud. It is not a managed service provider. The business model is different. The procurement of it's different. The contracts are different. The, the architecture is different. The operations are different. Everything is different. This is not a managed service provider cloud. But the first thing I have to do when I come into a room and talk to customers about it that are at their very first point in contemplating cloud is try to uh, inform them on how it's different, why it's different. Okay, and if I can get them to understand that, then all of the other stuff that we talk about gets much, much easier because we have to constantly challenge the assumptions that they have that this is, this is the same thing we've been doing for 25 years, it's just a different vendor doing it. And it's not true. It's custom software, custom hardware, custom ASICs. Everything is custom about this cloud. It bears no resemblance to the cloud that managed service providers have been using or trying to create inside that environment. None at all. You can't buy this hardware, you can't buy this software, you can't buy the custom ASICs that they have running in these cards, okay? The only purchaser, the only customer of all that stuff is AWS, and they build that infrastructure so that you can build on top of it. But we have to resist the temptation to think that this is just another version of what we've been using for 25 years, because it's not. Okay. Now, if we can get past that, then we can get on to some of these other things. So, for instance, very often, and another very rational question is, do I have parity with my on-premise security controls? Because I know what I need to control. I, need, I know where my data is. I know I have IDS, IPS. I know that I have, you know, 
layers and layers of controls, I need those same controls from those same vendors because you've invested in training, right? You've got lots of expertise around those vendors' controls. So you don't want to flush that down the toilet, right? You want to be able to leverage all that stuff. And that makes complete sense. You have lots of routing and switching expertise that have, has been developed in your organization over the last 20, 25 years. A lot of firewall expertise. You, do, you don't need to flush that all down the drain because most of the vendors that you have on premise, they're already in the AWS marketplace, just there waiting for you with the products that you probably run on premise already. So if you want to go that route, you absolutely have the option to do that. Again, a thousand, thousand ways to do anything. But this is, again, when you, when you just lift and shift, okay, that means that you lift and shift all the stuff that you've been doing, including the problems, including the challenges, into a dramatically newer, modern environment that will support that stuff. Okay? But that's not the cloud. Okay, that's what the cloud was three, four, five years ago. Do you remember AWS has been doing this since 2006? The modern cloud is much different, and I'll show you what that looks like here. Um, also, compliance, as we heard today, compliance is a big deal, and compliance is, means different things to different organizations. They have different standards they have to comply to. Some are regulated, some are industry standards, and so on. The CSA has got all sorts of helpful stuff, like the STAR registry and the CCM. <clears throat> Okay, so your ability to be able to comply with that, okay, again, challenge the notion that someone has to physically walk into a data center to comply with some of that regulation. Okay, and some, in some organizations, it's true, right? But that's how you build a chain of trust using, let's say, a SOC 2 Type 2 or other one of the other 60-plus certifications, attestations that we have, and then you do your own stuff on top of that, right? Okay. Um, and then finally, the last one is by using a local service provider in this market, that means that those local service providers aren't subject to U.S. jurisdiction. So if there's a warrant or a subpoena or a Cloud Act request for data, they're immune to that. Okay? And, and i got to be honest with you guys, that's mostly nonsense, right? Those are local service providers like to say that stuff. The reality is there's a legal test to determine whether that's true. Okay, there's a thing called minimal contacts. Okay, if that provider has uh, physical presence in the United States, okay, they have people working there, they have executives there. If they have customers in the United States, and a minimal contact in that scenario is, hey, you have a website, and someone from the United States came over and used it. Okay, that brings you into U.S. jurisdiction. So vendors telling you that they're not subject to the Cloud Act, do your due diligence. Find out, do they have a physical presence in the United States? Do they have revenue from customers in the United States? Do customers from the United States visit their websites? Okay, Because if any of that's true, they bear the same risk as, as all the US-based vendors bear. Okay, So just do your due diligence on that. Okay, All right, so those are a lot of the underlying assumptions, the myths, um, and the opportunity you know, there's two game changers that I'm, I'm really passionate about uh, from an AWS perspective for security and compliance professionals. And we've heard all the speakers talked about them today in one way or another. But I just want to, like, pin the tail on the donkey, as they say, right? I want to be very, very clear what they are. So there's a ton of differences between on-prem and cloud. And, you know... Your organizations are probably using cloud in some way now, and so some of this stuff is old news. Okay, but what I want to do is I really want to focus on two on this list. So first, the central control plane, the API. We heard lots of people talk about APIs today. Okay, this is one of the game changers. And then the other thing is automation. We've heard several people talk about automation as well. Okay, uh, and that's also a game changer. So let's start with with automation. Now. You heard Olaf earlier talk about governance. We actually heard a couple of people talk about governance. But the reality is the way that we've been doing governance now for you know, 20 years, a couple of decades, essentially is your um, audit team, your governance risk compliance team, they try to write down standards, right? These are our standards, and these are the things that we're going to have to comply with when we implement and operate new IT. Okay? So they take that, they write it, it's a Word doc, they put it in a file, I went last and I got burned on the mic. <clears throat> uh, you can have this one. Okay. This one. I like to walk around. 
All right, let's. Uh, Okay, so what happens with governance is they take that Word doc that has all the policies in it, it could be tons and tons of Word docs, okay, and when the architecture team or the strategy team goes to create some new um, IT capabilities for the organization, they have to follow those policies, that's why they're there. Okay, so the architecture team architects the solution according to those policies so that it complies with those policies. They hand that off to the project team that's uh, now going to implement that architecture. Okay, so they go and they interpret the policy themselves and they look, they look at the architecture and then they go and implement it. And there could be dramatically, I'm sorry, there could be dramatically different, uh, um, uh, uh, dramatically different assumptions and interpretations of that policy. Later on, when they get to a milestone or a lease gate, now the audit team comes along the compliance team, and says, now let's check whether the, what you've implemented actually meets the policy. And if there's gaps, if there's deficiencies, they send them back into development and they have to go back and fix that stuff and come back and they play this game. Okay? Then later on, once they figured it out, the, the compliance team will share the policy the updates, if any have come from that, and just how that whole thing is performed back with the architecture or strategy team so they are informed on how this is supposed to work, what worked well, what didn't, and so on. Okay, cool. For now. Yeah, if you got another mic, that'd be great. But, um, and so this, what we're talking about here with automation, is a game changer for governance. It's a game changer for security. It's a game changer for, for compliance. Okay, so for instance, imagine instead of having Word docs with policy written inside of them, it's not a Word doc at all. It's actually code, right? So you're actually writing code that's going to run in, on a computer, okay? So that code is the policy that's been codified and written in a language, in a programming language. Okay, so now that code is going to be used as the basis for all of the checks for compliance. And because it's not a manual process, the, the actual project team that's implementing the project can check what the gaps are constantly, in real time. They can generate all sorts of reporting from that. Okay? And then when they get to a milestone and the compliance team comes to check, well, instead of having to go and manually check whether they met the policy and the same interpretation of the policy, they can simply go to the dashboard that you've created to consume all of that governance uh, checking and they can look and see, like everybody else can, does it actually comply? Where are the gaps? And that same compliance dashboard, all of that compliance information can now be shared, not just back with the architecture team that needs it, but it can be shared with the compliance team, it can be shared with the operations team because they can benefit from that. Is it still in compliance? Is it not in compliance? You can share it with the audit team, so both internal audit, external audit. And it literally, you cannot ship anything unless it meets all those requirements, and that's automated. So there's no interpretation going on here, no cutting corners. That speeds up the development and release process dramatically. And then from an infrastructure perspective, you can see here we call it infrastructure as code. That means that I can provision servers, I can provision services running code. There's no more putting a DVD in a drive or going to a network share and installing Windows on a box or Linux on a box that way. Okay, the beautiful thing about this is once I codify, like I write the code to actually deploy my server if that's what I'm doing, and I press the button to, to deploy it, it, it deploys the same way whether, whether I'm deploying one of them or a million of them. It's the same one button. Okay? And you can constantly deploy systems this way. The beautiful thing about it is, is these, you can create short-lived infrastructures this way. So if the bad guys ever did get a foothold on a server because you were missing a patch, right? A there was a zero-day vulnerability and now they got on that server very quickly. The fact that that server only lives for a few hours before it gets shut down and, and rebuilt from scratch makes it nearly impossible for them to do the types of exploitation that they've done in the past. They can't use that as a beachhead because it doesn't last for more than a couple of hours. The other thing is configuration is code. You can always comply, you can always check whether what you have running in production is what you deployed. Because you know what it, you deployed, it's code. That code is used to compare what's running in production. And if there's configuration differences, 
you've got options. Do you want to bring it back into configuration? Do you want to blow it away and rebuild a new one from scratch because you know it's going to comply? Do you want to take a copy of that, put it in a new virtual private cloud, let's call it a clean room, call your forensics team, set up the forensics software on that server so they can analyze it all in real time? You can do anything because it's code. And now you have total visibility and control because it's infrastructure is code, configuration is code, and the policy itself is code. This speeds everything up and makes sure that you're always complying with whatever standards you care about. Okay? All right. Um, and this is what Olaf mentioned in his presentation earlier, is that concept of a CI-CD pipeline, continuous uh, integration, continuous delivery. Imagine that since everything's code, that if you, ch if you have your security checks in every step of that process, right from check-in to build all the way through to maintain, and you're, you're enforcing all of your security in that process, nothing can get through that process unless it meets your security and compliance requirements. Okay, nothing can ever get into production unless it meets your requirements from the get-go. Okay, that's the power of the DevSecOps you know, culture, uh, philosophy, technology stack that supports that, right? Is This is very, very powerful, okay? All right, so uh, the other game changer I talked about, we talked about automation. Now let's talk a little bit about the API. So the, the application program interface, everything in AWS is API driven. Okay, so in, again, instead of having to remote into a system using SSH or RDP, terminal server, whatever, you can actually um, just send an API call to there. Thank you very much. You can just send an API call to the system and it gets authenticated. If the API call is authorized, then it just runs. And that generates a bunch of data that you can use for good things as well. So the API becomes really powerful because it's authenticated. You can check if it's authorized. Uh, it's very quick. You can see all sorts of benefits here. But now you have real power. Let me explain why why I think this is a game changer. No matter how you use AWS, it goes through an API. So for instance here, the AWS Management Console, that's where you log in in your browser. Everything you do in that browser is going through an API to get to AWS, okay? If you run scripts from the command line interface, the CLI, or you're running manual commands from the command line and you're interacting with AWS, you're using the same set of APIs. And finally, if you write an application using an SDK, compiler, linker, and all that, and it's interacting with AWS, it's going through the same set of APIs. So that makes those APIs the perfect place for visibility and control. You see everything that happens in your account because they have to go through the API. It's all authenticated, it's all authorized. Okay, and then what we do is we actually have a service called CloudTrail, and all of the API calls in your account are put into that log. Now you can do really interesting things with the automation that we just talked about. You can constantly be looking at CloudTrail and what it's doing and like what it's logging. And if you're looking for indicators of compromise, if you're looking for skew from your standards that you care about, you'll identify that in near real time and then you'll be able to take action on that. Bring it back into standard. Call the incident response team. Take the system offline. There's all sorts of things that you can do because it's code. It's automated. So this is a game changer. Being able to use all of the API calls inside of CloudTrail will help you do all sorts of things. Look for indicators of compromise, troubleshoot problems, uh, stay in compliance with standards. This is really cool stuff because that combination of the API-driven cloud and the automation that we talked about, you can't do this on premise no matter how much money you have, not at scale. And this is baked right into AWS from scratch. So anyone with a credit card and 60 seconds to open an account gets this. It's baked into the, into the platform. This isn't something that you have to spend six months architecting, six months deploying, and then operate for five, the next five years. This is baked into the cloud. Okay? So here's an example of how you could use this. I mentioned this. So you've got a bunch of services here that you're using. Things are changing in those resources. AWS config is a service that sits there and watches the configuration of those services. You decided what the configuration was. And AWS config makes sure that they always stay in that configuration. So, so let's say you have a bunch of standards here, okay? A bunch of standards packages, compliance packages. You can constantly compare what's happening with changes to these resources and whether your rules that you have set up in AWS config are being triggered. 
So if something does change, you're going to know in near real time and you're going to be able to take action based on whatever rules that you define. So that can be, again, notifications. You can uh, do API calls to services. And then you can also do, as I mentioned, snapshots for forensics purposes or whatever. It's code. You can do whatever you want. A thousand, thousand ways to do any one thing. Okay? So in summary, I just want to run down those myths again. Very often, you know, we hear the same... Uh, initial concerns from, from folks that are just figuring out whether they want to use the cloud or not. And they're perfectly rational. They really are. But for folks, the Cloud Security Alliance, you know, and, and the broader audience, I just really want them to know that we hear you loud and clear. We completely understand. These are rational things to be asking when contemplating moving into the cloud. So um, the key, as I mentioned, is, is just keep in the back of your mind. The cloud is not just another managed service provider. It really isn't. Okay, the technology is different. The business model is different. If you can get rid of that assumption inside of your organization, you are going to, you know, you are going to be set free, as they say. You'll be able, if you challenge that assumption all the way along, you'll see that this model is much different than that one, and you shouldn't. Resist, you should resist the temptation to use those same assumptions over and over again when, when contemplating the cloud. Because frankly, most of them don't apply anymore, right? When you start to actually take a look at how we're using virtualization, encryption, key management, bare metal systems, it's, it's a much different world, right? But you have to dig into the technology to really see that, okay? Um, we talked a little bit about improved security control choices. So you've got the marketplace where you have all the vendors that you guys have been using for 10, 20 years. There's tons of them up there, 300 security offerings up there right now. The last time I looked, it's probably more now. Um, we talked about improved visibility and control. So I heard today several people say you don't have the visibility and control that you had on premise. No, you actually have more. Okay. What they remember draw a line between the infrastructure that all that stuff is running on and the stuff that you actually use and you're actually securing, right? It's a shared responsibility model. You're delegating the responsibility to manage and secure all that infrastructure underneath there. And remember, it's not Windows and Linux and all this. It's custom operating systems, custom hypervisors, custom hardware. You've delegated all that stuff to AWS to manage and patch. And you get to focus on the stuff above that, which means that you've just eliminated most of the technical debt that you've been carrying on premise all these years, right? All right, so uh, we talked about how to use automation and API and how that really does provide visibility and control that you can't get on premise. Um, and then, you know, the cloud can reduce cost and complexity of meeting your compliance obligations, and it can do that continuously, right? Because now you can have policy as code. And since your infrastructure is code, your configuration is code, you can always be in policy. And you, and you have the machines checking it all the time instead of humans. If you do this in addition to your point in time audits that you have to do if you're in a regulated industry, that will definitely reduce the cost and it will definitely reduce the resources and the burden to make that happen. Okay? And then finally, you know, encryption and key management is the primary mitigation for unauthorized access to data. So if the first question on your mind is, who has access to my data and how do I prevent that? Encryption and really good key management is the answer to that question, right? Whether you're trying to mitigate it on premise or you're trying to mitigate it in the cloud, it's the same mitigation, right? Okay? All right. And so with that, I'll thank you. And I think we have time for questions, don't we? Anyone have any questions? All right, hold on. Right. Yeah, sure. So a lot of the a lot of the SaaS providers are already based on AWS, but from our view, like in the Cloud Security Alliance, they, they've always used the paradigm of SaaS, PaaS, and IaaS, right? And in the beginning, when we started talking about this stuff ten years ago, that made total sense. Um, most of the service providers sort of th that was the pivot of their product offerings around those three categories. But in AWS parlance, we have over 165 services. And that's because the services are using each other as building blocks. So these lines between IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS are blurred. And my advice is, is stop using them. 
because they're at this point they're old fashioned, they're quaint, right? You can make an argument that you want to use IaaS and you want to use AWS to do that in the EC2 service, and lots of customers do, tons and tons of customers. And customers come for that, but what they realize very quickly is the serverless stuff that we talked a little bit about, the container stuff that we talked about, and the other 163 plus services that we didn't really get into, right? That's what they love once they get in there and they realize that they don't have to spend all their time patching 16,000 vulnerabilities a year, potentially, okay? They can actually just focus on innovating around their customers. That's what they love, but they ha it's a journey and it, it, it's the epiphany doesn't happen at the beginning of that journey. Yeah, sure, and, and I got the impression from your presentation that part of what the board, the board is doing, right, is you have somebody doing a risk assessment based on what that minimum standard is for the bank against those SaaS services, against AWS services, and so on. And then if we meet your, your standards or the, your requirements, then you'll anoint that service that you can use that. We have a thing in AWS called the service catalog, which allows you to publish only the services that you approve, and then no one else can use the other 165 services. Whatever the, that service catalog is, you get to prove that, yeah. But I agree, so the other, the other SaaS providers still have to meet that, um, that bar. And very often, if they're built on AWS, it's again that chain of trust. So what they can do is they can immediately give you the AWS SOC 2 or point you to it, right? So go check out the SOC 2 type 2. You've seen it a thousand times. So that saves you time right there. But what many of them don't understand is they own the next piece of that stack on top of AWS. So where is their SOC 2 type 2, right? And so what, quite honestly, because I've worked so closely with the CSA over the years, is when I meet a vendor that doesn't have a SOC 2 type 2 and probably doesn't have the resources to get one because it's super hard, right, to get one of those and keep it. I always recommend the, the CSA, CCM, or the STAR as that place where they can build the next piece of that chain because the, their customers might not demand a SOC 2 type 2 from them, but if they have something, if they have the, the CCM or STAR uh, registry for that, they're at least recognizing what assurance is and the importance of that, and they've at least gone through some process by an industry association that's world recognized for this stuff, um, so that they can show that they've taken it seriously, right? Yeah, good question. Any other questions? No, oh, so this is a, it's a risk conversation, right? So there are organizations out there that don't view their cloud service provider as a risk and don't view governments as a risk. And so very often they're the ones that'll ask the question because they're doing due diligence and after you show them KMS and Cloud HSM and these other things and talk to them about risk management, they're on their way, they never mention it again. But there's, there's uh, a small minority of customers that, are, that have that kind of data that's regulated, right? So GDPR is a good example, or healthcare data or whatever, that they're super, super uh, focused on making sure that they keep up their GD, GDPR obligations or their, their healthcare obligations or financial services obligations. Sure, sure. And I get, I get questions like that from governments as well. The thing about governments is they have what's called sovereign immunity. And so when they ask about it, very often we'll point them back to the general counsel because if they check into it, you know, a federal government of, uh, uh, of a country in EMEA is not going to be subject to an order like that because they have sovereign immunity. They get to decide what they're doing with their citizens and their data in their country. And so with federal governments, it's a different story altogether, but many of them don't, you know, want to talk about that anyway, right? But for, for most of the other folks that do, that will view government access to data as a risk, a real risk, and they want to mitigate it, that's where we talk about encryption 
uh, and virtualization and, and key management and so on. And um, my advice is, is, again, there's a thousand, thousand ways to do anything. So if you want the most assurance that your data is safe in the cloud and no one can get access to that data, keep the keys on premise, right? Or another thing that we just released not too long ago is what we call uh, our, our custom uh, key store solution where you can create it, a, use Cloud HSM, which is an H, a hardware security module in the cloud, and you actually keep the keys and provision the keys there, and it's inside a virtual private cloud. So you've got all of the layers of protection so that AWS and any other person that's not authorized to get access to that stuff can't get access to it. You have all the detection capabilities we talked about with APIs, the API logs, and all the automation and all that. And so because that HSM is in your own VPC that you're managing and AWS doesn't have access to, then you keep the keys in there, but you can still provision keys to, or, or there's an integration, what we call the custom key store, that you can use with KMS. And the beautiful thing about that is the customer master key is kept in your HSM, in your VPC, and KMS, since it's integrated with 40 plus services, it can still, uh, provision keys out to those services when they request keys to encrypt and decrypt data. But now, because you have the master key in that HSM, you own the lifetime of that key and you own the durability of that key. And so if you want to uh, immediately expire that key, you can do it. You have the power to do that. And all of a sudden, you'll have to create a new key or maybe you're, you're trying to crypto delete your data. That's another question I get around encryption or with data is, hey, how do you, how do you delete our data? And the answer is we don't because we don't have access to to data, right, to your content. We don't want access to your content. So one way that you can you can delete it is encrypt it and throw away the key and now it's deleted, right? So there's, again, there's a thousand, thousand ways to do anything in AWS. But a good set of requirements based on risks that you care about and high value assets of your organization is the place to start. So getting away from the emotional conversation around government to access to data, that's just another unauthorized party and you should be if that's a risk that, that you know, gets above the line and you actually want to fund that risk and put resources around mitigating that risk, then um, you should manage it like any other unauthorized access to data scenario. And that means you're going to do things around you know, identity, detection, encryption, maybe even dedicated systems on bare metal so you're not even in a multi-tenant environment anymore, right? So you've got lots of options is the point. Any other questions? I think we're, he said we're going to wrap up the day. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, all of us who stayed all the way up to here. We give you a certification of excellence for sticking up with us. And thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the Cyber Week. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers.